As a startup founder, a customer persona tells you everything that you need to know. It tells you who your customer is, where to find them, what messaging is going to resonate with them, what problems are most important to them, how your product fits in the context of their lives, and so much more. And yet, so many founders just don't do them. So in this video, I'm going to talk about how you can use customer personas to help your startup find traction. What's up, everyone? My name is JDM, aka Josh David Miller, and I create videos to help first-time founders find traction for their startups. The bulk of this video is going to be about what a customer persona is, how you can create one, then how you can use one to great effect, some mistakes that come into play, and more. But before we get too much into customer personas, I want to talk about why they're necessary in the first place. So we're going to take a big step back and talk about design thinking just a little bit. If you're already familiar with design thinking, and if you're already sold on customer personas being right for you, go ahead and use the chapter markers to skip ahead past this segment. But I encourage you to stick around because you might pick up something new. We roughly think about design thinking as a human-centered approach to solving wicked problems. And if you're not inducted into the language, wicked problems are basically those that don't have an actual solution to the problem, something like homelessness, where we can say, okay, well, if we could just put all the homeless people in homes and problem solved, but that's of course not true because we actually don't know what the problem of homelessness is. And so we have to ask questions and do work to clarify what the problem of homelessness is so that we could solve it. That's where design thinking makes its play. And so for your startup or for any innovative effort that you might be working on, it's very similar. We actually don't know where we're going to end up. We have this idea of a thing and we might be right, but we're wrong about a lot of it. And so we co-create our product with our customer. Step one is to try to understand the customer very deeply, to empathize with them, to understand what's going on inside their head. What are their motivations and wants and needs and fears and jobs to be done and what are their demographics and psychographics and so much more. Step two is to then define what the problem is that we're trying to solve. In the case of a wicked problem like homelessness, that might be let's focus on mental health or that might be uh, let's focus on a social safety net or the economic factors of, of the unhoused. In the case of our startup, it's what problem might we be solving for a customer? What problem makes the most sense in the context of the space we want to work in? So we define the problem. Step three is that we then ideate around potential solutions. There are a number of ways to skin the proverbial cat, and we've got to find the one that makes the most sense for us to focus on. What's the solution that we think is most likely to bring resolution to that problem in a way that our customers will love? Step four is that we create a prototype of that potential solution. And step five is we put that prototype in front of customers in order to get real feedback. And then we iterate back again. Did we have the correct understanding of the customer? Were we working on the right problem? And if we were, then did we have the right solution? And if we did, was the prototype exactly right? Or do we need to iterate on the prototype? Or did we freaking crush it the first time? Which never happened. That's design thinking at its core. And you can see the process starts with that deep empathy for the customer. And this is where personas come into play. They give us a foundation for who the customer is and gives us a means of talking about them. But personas also give us a baseline of assumptions so that we know what are the assumptions that we were wrong about, which ones are we uncertain about and need to test, and ultimately which ones were validated, which ones were we right about. So they evolve over time. Personas are just a way of documenting all of those things we know or think we know or hypothesize or guess we know about our customers. We like to call them semi-fictional representations of a real customer. And that might be a weird, complex term, but it's actually fairly straightforward. So they're representations of real customers, meaning these aren't fictional characters that we just pulled out of a hat. They look like fundamentally the real people that we think we want to serve. But they're also not a real customer. They're not somebody we've already served. They're a semi-fictional representation of that. They're the archetype of that. They're the ideal customer that we want to serve. They really do show us who our customer is, even though they themselves are not a real customer. And to be semi-fictional, they have to have a lot of meat around it. We even give them a name, but we'll come back to that in a sec. To build a persona, you start with the basic stuff. You start with a name, you start with their age, you start with their, their income level. Are they well off or are they less well off? Are they well educated? Are they poorly educated? Are they somewhere in between? Are they single? Are they married? Are they employed? Are they self-employed? If they're employed for a company, what is their status within that company? 
etc. And once we have that, we can give them a backstory. So if they went to college, where did they go to college? What was that experience like for them? If they have 20 years of career experience, what companies were they working for? What did that look like? What roles did they have? What was the progression in the course of their career? We want to really get a detailed understanding of where they've been so we can figure out where they're going. So we create a robust bio, a big background, multiple paragraphs of information about where this person came from. Then we want to move on to their personality. Are they introverted? Are they extroverted and super social? Are they highly analytical? Are they more creative? Are they really busy because they have kids and full-time jobs? Or are they time rich? Maybe they're retired. Maybe they're students before the craziness of college. Just from a personality perspective, are they messy or are they well-organized? Are they independent, woody woodpecker, going rogue? Or are they team players who just love to be part of the ecosystem? And more. And none of these are binaries. They're a spectrum. But because these are semi-fictional representations of real customers, we want to figure out where exactly they are on the spectrum of each of these, because it's going to tell us a lot when it comes time to use them. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So already we have names for them, we understand their education and their background, we have a bio, we have information about their personality, and now we're going to go even deeper below the surface to find out more about them. Starting with their interests. What actually interests them? Even if you're selling something B2B where you think you only care about the company, well, I'm serving small business florists who, no, you're not serving small business florists. You're serving the owner of the small business who's a florist. So what is their education? What is their background? What are their interests? What captures their attention? What captures their imagination? What motivates them to get up in the morning? What are they afraid of? And more. And then you want to figure out who their influences are. Where do they get their information? How do they learn about things? And particularly when it comes to whatever service or product that you're offering, where do they learn about those? Do they get recommendations from their peers? Do they find about this in trade publications or do they go to conferences? Is it LinkedIn ads? Are they getting this from influencers? Where are they actually getting information about the products that they try? What motivates them? Why are they who they are? Why do they do what they do? And more than that, where do they feel those motivations are building? What are their goals? What are their goals in life? What are their goals in their careers? What are their goals in their hobbies? What is it that they want to achieve? What is it that they want to get out of their life? And all of that creates needs and expectations that the customers have. They have jobs that they need to get done. They have certain needs that just have to be met. And they also have certain expectations about how those needs get met. What do they need to do and how are they expecting to get that done? And lastly, what are some of their pain points? What are some of their frustrations? What is it that's just not going right? What is it that's stuck in their craw and bothering them? What's keeping them up at night? What are minor annoyances throughout their professional lives, throughout their hobbies, throughout their careers? What is it that's bothering them? What is it that annoys them? Where are they finding that pain? Where's that frustration? Where can we dig in to mine for value that we can create? What are their problems? Okay, so at its core, that's a persona. And that's all a persona is. And I say that that's all that it is, as if it's really simple, even though it's actually extraordinarily complicated. And it's a lot. And the first big objection that anybody has to creating this persona is, whoa, that's a lot of information. I don't think I know all that information. And you're right. You absolutely don't know all that information. But you know enough to create an hypothesis that you can go out and test. We'll come back to that at the end of the video but you definitely know enough to get something started. And that leads to the second objection that founders commonly have with personas, where they think that's really specific. That's awfully specific. I can't get that specific. And you actually have to. Frederick the Great said to defend everything is to defend nothing. And I don't think it's really hidden what he meant. You have a finite number of resources, a finite number of soldiers. If you send them to defend everything, you're actually defending nothing. And there's a metaphysical, philosophical level on which that works too. But for our purposes here, to market to everyone or to serve everyone is to serve no one. We have to get specific. We have to niche down to find a customer that we can serve well enough and specifically enough that we, with our limited resources and our limited time and our limited budget, can actually just break through that noise and get through to them where they need that message. So that naturally leads to the question of how specific should personas get? And the answer is going to be a very 
big nebulous one, but one that I still think is helpful. You want to get so specific, so detailed, so precise that it actually makes you uncomfortable. You want to get so detailed and so specific that you're like, that's going to be like four people out there. That makes me really uncomfortable. Ah. You want to get to that level of discomfort. And then you want to get three levels more specific than that. Awfully specific. We have to niche down when we're doing something new and innovative because we have those finite resources. As we've established, you don't have all that information. So how do you go about filling out one of these personas? Well, the best way to start is just with your gut. Start filling one out. What makes sense? Who do you think your customer is? You're starting with some idea of who you think they are. So put that down on paper and then see what does that tell you about other things? I was working with some founders just the other day in a competition and they thought their hypothesis about customers was pretty light. But as we started to probe deeply, we started to figure out that there was a lot more there that they thought that they knew than they knew that they thought that they knew, if that makes sense. As an example, they knew that they were targeting females who were in their late 30s, who had kids and who needed the services of a mechanic from time to time, or at least felt the anxiety that comes with needing the services of a mechanic from time to time. So that tells us a lot more than you think, because if that person's out there, and if they have that particular anxiety, it also tells you that they're not driving a new car. New cars are less likely to need those services and new cars have warranties which tells us that she's driving an older car. Not only that, but she doesn't have the extended warranty. And not only that, the car can't be too old because if it's too old, it's not just the anxiety of that, it's actively getting repairs. So the problem that we're solving is the mechanic problem and not the anxiety that comes with it, et cetera. And from all of that, we can determine her income level because if she's not driving a brand new car, it's a car that's five, six years old. So she's also probably not super affluent, probably also not super worried about having the latest and greatest of things. So we could start to get those personality details just from that hypothesis. So when you're filling out a customer persona, start with your gut and see what follows what. What can you actually just juice out of the assumption to get as much detail as you can out of the hypothesis that you have? Another way you can do it is actually with ChatGPT. You can go to ChatGPT and ask it questions about people. You can ask it what the average education levels are for certain individuals. You can ask it to tell you the story from the perspective of somebody. You can ask ChatGPT to describe the details of that person's life. You can ask them to describe the kinds of places where certain people get information. And it's not going to be 100% accurate, and that's not the point. It's going to give us a bunch of robust information that we can then use to populate our persona. We can use that as our research assistant or as our AI co-founder, if you will, to get the information that we need to fill out a robust persona. Another way, which we'll come back to later, is you can actually go out and talk to them. Once you have an understanding of who you think these customers are and where their influences are, then you know how to get in front of them. And once you know how to get in front of them, you can get in front of them and you can have a conversation. And once you have that conversation, you're going to learn more about them because you're going to ask about their background. You're going to ask about their influences. You're going to ask about their pains. You're going to ask about their goals. You're going to ask about what keeps them up at night. And all that information is stuff that you can take back to say, was I right about this? Was I wrong about this? So you can go and do a customer interview to help you fill out those customer personas. Now let's talk about how you put a customer persona into practice. Customer personas have a lot of applications based on what stage of your startup life cycle you're at right now. If you're a really early stage startup, this might just help you get in front of them. It might just help you find them, or it might help you to identify what problem you think is most important for your customer. What is the problem that is severe enough and urgent enough that they're willing to pay money to you to help solve it? Or it might tell you what solutions are likely to resonate with them based on the context of their lives. In other words, it'll help you when it comes time to define the right problem and to ideate around potential solutions. But also, if you're further along in the life cycle of your startup, they'll also help you figure out things like feature prioritization. Like how do you know when you take this big product roadmap of this big massive set of features, personas can help you reason through what's most likely to be important to your ideal customers. You can interrogate personas just like you would a real people to juice the work that you've done there to figure out, is this a reasonable assumption? Is this a reasonable inference for what is going to likely resonate with my customers? 
You can also use customer personas to identify channels. If you have a list of influences as part of your customer persona, then that tells you where you might be able to find these people. But an underappreciated use case for personas is in messaging. So when you start to figure out, what do I throw on that early LinkedIn DM? Or what do I put on our landing page? How do I articulate our value proposition? You can go back to these customer personas. You throw up the customer persona and you say, okay. And then you throw up your message and you say, is this person going to resonate with this message? And if the answer is no, if just looking at it, you say like, actually that message isn't really going to resonate with them because that's designed for somebody who's a little bit more extroverted and a little bit uh, less organized. Whereas we have a, uh, a customer who is inherently much more organized, much more A-type, but also a bit more introverted, then that likely isn't going to resonate as well with them. Even something as simple as an appeal to authority. If they're not thinking of those authorities as influences for them, then that appeal to authority is likely going to fall on deaf ears. Customer personas have just so many uses that it just, it floors me that more founders don't have a customer persona that they can go back and reference. So I recommend that you take some time right now to create a detailed customer persona. Again, one that is so specific that it makes you feel uncomfortable and then go three clicks more specific than that. And if you don't know where to begin, I do actually have a template that you can use. It's completely free. If you just follow the link in the description, you can snag this template. It's a fig jam. It's an easy tool to use. It's like a digital dry erase board. If you're not familiar with that, a digital whiteboard, you just fill it out with sticky notes and with text and whatever else uh, makes sense to you. And then you have this nice document that you can use. So check out in the description, the link for that free resource. The last thing that I want to talk about is what I said I'd come back to at the end, which is that your customer personas are really just this big ass bucket of assumptions. They're just this set of stuff that you think is true. And really early on, it might just be based on your gut. It might just feel right or sound right, or it might be a reasonable inference, but it's still just based on your gut. And then you might do some more research and it might get a little bit more robust. Then you might start talking to customers and it might get even more robust. And over time, these personas are something that you revise again and again and again to get them to be more accurate and more specific and more in line with the market that you're trying to serve. And a big mistake of customer personas that founders make is that they create these personas once, check it off as an item of their to-do list, throw it in a box, then put the box on a shelf and then move on. And they're just not going to do you any good that way. Create them as a baseline and then keep revising them as you get more data. And then you always have something to reference that says, this is who we're serving. This is what they look like. This is what's important to them. And there are lots of ways that you can go about the process of validating them. I mentioned a few. You can use search or chat GPT to get information back that you can incorporate. Obviously, you can just talk directly to these customers, but there are a lot more ways too. As you start maybe running ads or as you're doing landing page tests, as you're doing rapid prototype interviews with customers, there are lots of ways that you're going to start collecting data back. And all of that data that comes back will either serve to validate or invalidate something on your persona. If you're running an experiment and it ends up at the end of the day having no impact on your customer persona, you either didn't learn anything or more likely your persona just wasn't detailed enough. Every experiment that you run, you get that data back and you want to turn it into what startups call validated learning. It's information that you thought was reasonable. It made sense. You got information back and it validated it. It's validated learning. And all of those should flow back in so that at any point in time, you have an up-to-date, robust customer persona that you can use to create intense focus in finding traction and product market fit. So that's it for this video. Go ahead and grab that free resource or use your own template and let me know who your customer is. Drop a link in the comments to your customer persona and I'll take a look. Let's get some conversation going around that. And with that, I'll see you guys next week. Peace.